A few years ago, I was riding my bicycle home uh, in Brooklyn uh, at about three o'clock in the morning, and I witnessed a shooting. I saw four people shoot a young man um, right in the middle of an intersection. Um, the assailants disappeared into the night. And as I learned later, this was an unsolved crime. The police were never able to track down the assailants of uh, this poor young 19-year-old who fortunately did not perish. Um, it occurred to me that a technology like this could have solved that crime. Because just like an IED attack, you don't need to know where it's going to happen ahead of time. You can see where it happened in the footage and then rewind and find where those four people went to. And you can also rewind further and see where they came from. And with that, you will have some really solid leads on which to base your investigation. For that reason, it's not surprising that a number of cities have invested in this technology. And while we don't have one city, at least publicly to date, at the moment flying this technology as we speak, um, there have been some very extensive programs in the past. The most extensive of which happened in the city of Baltimore in 2016. Uh, that year, a uh, billionaire philanthropist from Texas by the name of John Arnold, who likes to fund experiments with cutting-edge technologies that could have transformative potentials for law enforcement, made a donation to the city of Baltimore so that they could run this aerial surveillance technology over the city. Because it was a donation and did not come from the government budget, they did not have to seek any approval from the state attorney, from the mayor, the city council, or the state legislature. This was a little bit like the rogue cell in the NSA that uh, is de depicted in Enemy of the State, a kind of going it alone operation. Um, I was lucky enough to actually visit that operation when it was still secretly surveilling the city of Baltimore in 2016. And I sat in the operations center as they had this commanding view of 32 square miles of the city. They tracked hundreds of crimes. And they used some interesting loopholes, by the way. Uh, the, the city has this policy where if they have any surveillance footage that is not related to an ongoing investigation, they have to delete it within 30 days. Well, of course, if you record the entire city at once, there are no doubt many crimes that have happened on any given day. And so you can hold on to this footage indefinitely. I sat in on a briefing where the analysts from this company uh, showed detectives how they had tracked a group of murderers who had shot down a 31-year-old man in broad daylight away from the crime scene. Uh, I was not supposed to be there in that briefing, by the way. I sat very quietly in the back uh, because those were the instructions given to me. Um, at the end of that briefing, one of the detectives said that it was the best briefing on an investigation he had ever seen in his life. Another detective was so blown away, he almost didn't have any words. He said, oh my goodness, it's like that movie, Enemy of the State. By the way, it, it was only with the publication of this book that it became knowledge public knowledge that uh, the, the technology was indeed inspired by Enemy of the State. It has such an uncanny resemblance to the movie that it was always used as a way of explaining what the technology looks like. Isn't that funny? So when I found out that it actually was for a reason that they are so similar, I pretty much fell off my chair. Perhaps the strangest thing about being in Baltimore was stepping out onto the street after visiting this operations center on the second day. Having just a minute earlier watched the entire city, zooming in on neighborhoods, tracking random cars here and there. I stepped out onto the street. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and I tried seeing the aircraft. But it was operating so high, over 10,000 feet of altitude, that I couldn't see it. 
but I knew that it could see me because I had even zoomed in on the very street where I was then standing. And that felt uncomfortable enough, but much more uncomfortable was looking around me at all the other people who were being watched by a technology that they probably didn't even know existed and they had no idea. That to me just felt wrong. Incredibly, none of what the Baltimore Police Department did during that operation was illegal. In fact, if any of you wanted to get in an airplane with one of these cameras and surveil the people of New York, it would be within your rights to do so, as long as you observe the airspace regulations, because the airspace is public. If you you know, point your camera out of the window when you're on a commercial flight uh, from coast to coast and take a pretty picture of the landscape. What you've done is not illegal, right? You're exercising your First Amendment right to record images from public space. Well, <laughs> that law, or rather lack of laws, was developed at a time when this technology did not exist. It was developed at a time when really, in order to get into the sky, you needed a great deal of money and resources. And the technologies that you used once you're up there would certainly not be able to record an entire city at once. So that is where things stand now. There is nothing from a legal perspective or a legislative perspective blocking cities around the country from adopting this technology. Indeed, when the Baltimore operation was revealed, there was so much public outrage uh, that it had been a secret that it was canceled. But the man behind that company, uh, Persistent Surveillance Systems, has not given up. Uh, and he actually just uh, did a series of interviews last week where he said he now has his sights on St. Louis. Mm -hmm.